Good morning, Mary Meet, Hail, and welcome to the sanctuary where we have gathered for the last, is it 118 or 19 years? 18, yeah, I can never remember the birthday. <laughs> so as we've gathered here for the last 118 years sharing our varied interests and knowledge while focusing on the principles of Unitarianism, the foundation of our community. We especially welcome our visitors and new faces. This week is also special as our minister, Clay Nelson, and partner, Rachel Laraway, hopefully gaining some great ideas to share with you in future sermons. The service doesn't end until you have enjoyed a cup of tea and a chat in the second hour, where the conversation continues. We hope you'll stay for that, and we look forward to getting to know you better. I really love pasta, and I love to make it from scratch. One of my favorite service auction items was donating a pasta making class, including a machine, to take home. A week or so ago, I decided to make ravioli using some beautiful sausage meat that I get from the Westmere butchery. I cooked up a tomato sauce, made the dough, and started to make the little flavor filled packages. Half of the mixture, I made up as I always have done for the last 20 years. The other half, I decided to try out this ravioli tray, which had been kicking around my kitchen for a number of years unused. I floured it, rolled some dough over the top, filled each indentation with a little meat mixture, added the top, and used the rolling pin as directed to form the sealed, crimpled edges. What happened next wasn't supposed to. The ravioli didn't pop out of the tray as perfect little parcels, but instead stuck beyond all rescue, destined for the rubbish bin. A pile of torn up pasta interspersed with sausage. A minute later though, I grabbed a ceramic dish, lined it with tomato sauce, and started to layer up a stratum of broken pasta, meat, tomato and cheese all ready to be popped into an oven and enjoyed 40 minutes later. Completely different from what was originally intended, but extremely tasty. It's wondrous how human brains can come up with such ingenious ideas at the drop of a hat. Our creativity knows no bounds if we only keep an open mind and submit. As we light this flame, may we all take the time to fully immerse in our creative potential, no matter the medium. May we all be reminded that the process matters, not just the final outcome. If you haven't noticed yet, I'm pretty bald and don't have much need for a hairdryer. Though I could probably think of some interesting uses for one. I could use it to mount some cheese on toast, and then again later to blow the crumbs out of the bed. Only last week I found out that while travelling, you can wash your socks in the sink and then pop them over the end of a hairdryer on full blast to dry them out. <laughs> the hot air blowing through does the job in no time, hopefully before the fuse block box blows. That's a real tongue twister. What I'd like you to do for the next minute is to close your eyes and think of all the different things you could do with a hairdryer. you can open again. I won't count them, but what you've just done is an exercise as a test of your ability for divergent thinking. The ability to find multiple solutions to a problem. Divergent thinking is closely related to creativity. The more ways you thought of using that hairdryer, the more creative potential you probably have. 
Looking at people's divergent thinking abilities has helped scientists understand the relationship between creativity and intelligence. In 2013, Austrian psychologists investigating creativity and intelligence found that once participants' IQ scores went above 86, their score was no longer predictive of their divergent thinking abilities. A person with a genius level IQ of 150 was no more likely to think of more solutions to a problem than someone with a more average IQ of 100. In other words, beyond a relatively low threshold, your overall intelligence makes no difference to your potential for creativity. Around 80% of the world's population has an IQ above this 86 threshold. An astounding 3 billion people walking around with the same creative potential as the geniuses that we are thought to idolise. So how can we make the most of this creative potential? Research indicates that it all comes down to practice. But not just any type of practice, it must enable you to expand your skills and challenge yourself. I'm a really bad accordion player. I could enter a service auction item for you all to bid not to hear me play. Mainly this is due to when I practice, I spend most of my time enjoying the music that I already know. If I spent more time on the scales, tricky fingering, improvisation and sight reading, essentially more purposeful practice time, I would slowly improve to a better performance level. Setting goals, having a tutor critique my performance and setting exercises at an increasing level of proficiency would be a much better use of my time and much better on my neighbour's ears. Unleashing your creative potential won't happen by practising the same skills over and over again in isolation. You have to make it your mission to continually develop skills and seek regular feedback. Why do we consider some people geniuses? The Unitarian Charles Darwin is often considered a genius for discovering natural selection. But he was not the only person to develop that theory. The honour goes to one of his contemporaries, Albert Wallace, whom history has all but forgotten, while Darwin is celebrated for his. Are those we deem geniuses really so unique and special? There must be other factors that give them this lauded status. Timing plays a big role when it comes to who society deems a genius. Indeed, the world remembers Charles due to his sense of urgency. In 1858, upon hearing that Wallace was working on the very same theory that he was, Darwin quickly arranged for a presentation of his ideas to the Linnean Society, appearing as if he was the driving force behind the theory of evolution. In the meantime, Wallace was sailing around the world for several years before publishing his own account of the theory. It was too late though, as Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, was already published, and Darwin was written into the history books forever. If I grabbed my soldering iron, a few wires, components, and put together a telephone, you'd probably think I was clever, but you wouldn't be too amazed. However, if I'd done it 150 years ago, I'd be a genius. That's because geniuses are inextricably linked to their historic context. If Andy Warhol created his masterpieces during the Italian Renaissance, he would have been labelled a heretic and his works destroyed before future generations had a chance to appreciate them. Similarly, if Leonardo da Vinci created his paintings now, his work would be considered hopelessly dated. Geniuses are a product of their time rather than universally brilliant individuals. What typically makes them stand out from common folk though is the amount of time spent exploring the output of their chosen industry. For those reaching the peak of mastery, this equates to about 20% of their time, or three to four hours a day. Painters continually attend art exhibitions, chef dine, chefs dine at new restaurants, and songwriters listen to, both, to music, both new and old. 
In my field of study, which is knitting, only half my time is spent on assignments and producing goods for assessment. The rest of my days I spend looking at garments, other designers' work, producing things that aren't related, but all providing insights to my vision of mastery. Lots of my time is spent gaining insight from other industries as well, weaving, art, theatre, architecture, just some of the places I find inspiration, as well as gaining fresh air and an opportunity to stretch my legs and space to think. We have a vision of the scholar as an inspired individual, feverishly working away. In my case, with an ever-increasing group of coffee mugs collecting around my desk, and when I'm really on a roll, dinner comes straight from a can. Although common in popular culture, the genius of imagination working alone in a remote cabin is far from reality. Creativity has a social component that is often overlooked, but is highly significant. In other words, it takes a community to make a creative genius. Research into high-achieving artists found that the quality of their reputations was directly associated to the number of relationships they had with other high-achieving artists. This research, conducted by the University of California, explored the social networks of thousands of artists, innovators, and scientists, discovering that the longevity and productivity of the individual's careers could be predicted by the quality of their social networks. I certainly would have no career in the apparel and textile industry if it wasn't for the international connections with the other professionals that I have. And it isn't a one-way student-teacher relationship either. The masters in my field all learn from each other and their students, even attending or teaching each other's classes. We question each other's work and we laugh at our mistakes and we rejoice in our successes. It is impossible to be world class on your own. You need to take a few talented friends, teachers, and employees along the way. Mastery is such a tricky word. Does anyone ever truly master anything? Is there not always room for improvement? Is there not always some force beyond our control? While many would define mastery as control over or superiority over another, when we're talking about true mastery, we mean control over the self and superiority to what you once were. Your only rival is the work you did yesterday as you seek to go further and deeper in your chosen field. Those who have applied this ethos become recognized as skilled. A master is one who is not only qualified in their field, but also hopefully passionate about passing on their craft, including both the traditions they learned as well as the hard-won knowledge that comes from doing. So the next generation can take the learning further and become even more skillful. For those in a paradigm of superiority and control over others, such sharing and mentoring will never happen. But those confident in their art and practice are not fearful of learning, a, of losing a part of their identity. Instead, they want their vocation as a whole to proceed to its fullest expression. It can be difficult to get there. I personally feel this all the time, which is why any master must continue to rigorously practice. When it comes to being a Unitarian, who are the masters in your social circle? Who are the friends, the teachers? How much of your day or your week is spent in consideration of our seven guiding principles? What are your goals and how are you extending yourself? I'll pause and let you reflect on that just for a moment. The fashion industry that I'm involved with is tough. We're coming up to Fashion Week, 
and we have hopeful designers spending tens of thousands of dollars in hopes of having their garments purchased, only to have to come up with a new collection in a few months' time. A decade ago, you might have noticed an Ed Hardy store pop up in Nuffield Street in Newmarket. It was the item du jour. Everyone seemed to be wearing Ed Hardy. In one year, 2009, worldwide, $700 million of Ed Hardy apparel were sold around the world. The following year, sales bombed. The store in Nuffield Street, I'm sure, is closed. This is an example of how humans paradoxical this is an example of humans paradoxical preference for both familiarity and novelty. Research indicates that the more familiar, familiar we are with something, the more we like it. As people saw Ed Hardy's clothes more and more often, they developed po positive associations with it, in turn driving up sales. In addition to their desire for familiarity, we have this counter desire for novelty. If I played you the same song eight times, you'd love it at first, but begin to like it less each time you heard it. People liked Ed Hardy's clothes as they began to see them more often, but as soon as they became ubiquitous, their desire for novelty kicked in and they quickly ditched them. This desire for familiarity and counter desire for novelty is a burden that infiltrates most areas of our lives. We love to go see a new movie, but the plots and characters have to be relatable. Anything completely obscure just doesn't sell. If I, was in, if I was to invent a new religion tomorrow, it would probably involve a fixed venue and a set time, maybe some music, some food afterwards, and just the gods and liturgy swapped out for the novelty factor. Last month, I was at the Australian Cheap and Wool Show in Bendigo. One of the problems looking for creative answers is the issue of textile waste polluting the environment. Though we all love to wear our favourite clothes, the novelty of op shopping to save the planet is wearing thin, and consumers are desiring something brand new. The producers I met with are working to ensure only natural fibres are being used in the textile industry, that in the textile industry, materials, dyes and processes, and that they're fit for purpose, but friendly for the environment, pre and post consumer as well. It was really wonderful to see sweaters being shredded up and re-spun into yarn, perfect for making something absolutely brand new meeting that consumer's demand for newness while also protecting the environment. When we look at some of the problems facing the world right now, like our climate change example, who are the geniuses that will come up with the solutions? Are they working alone? Or are they the common people that we see every day? The organisations that are formed to solve this problem will look a lot like current day organisations. We love something familiar. The structures will be common to us and they'll communicate in ways that will be comfortable. A planet friendly mode of transport will most likely have seats and wheels looking not much different to the vehicles that we see today. Our behaviours too will have to stay familiar and maybe harder to change than we think. We all really love to shop, but changing from a plastic bag back to a paper bag, it didn't take a genius. I have a reading for our meditation today. All that we have been, all that we will become. All that we have been separately and all that we will become together is stretched out before us and behind us, like stars scattered across a canvas of sky. We stand at the precipice, arms locked, together like tandem skydivers, working up the courage to jump. Tell me, friends, what have we got to lose? Our fear of failure, our mistrust of our own talents. 
What have we got to lose? A poverty of the spirit? The lie that we are alone? What wonders await us in the space between that first leap and the moment our feet, our wheels, however we move our bodies across the precious earth, touch down softly on unknown soil? What have we got to lose that we can't replace with some previously unimaginable joy? If you choose to follow a crowd which doesn't see much value in maintaining traditional practices and ways of being, what does it say for their ability to maintain and pass on the knowledge gained through past experience? If you choose to cross a bridge built today, how can you know it has been tried and tested by others and found sturdy? Will it be worth the risk? Do the strengths of the prophet ever truly reside in the mind of a single person, or more often f from a complex network of people all examining and evaluating the universe in search for enlightenment? Could you wander in the desert without a tribe? All are noble questions which I'm sure many, with I'm sure many answers. However, perhaps it were better to take any perilous journey with some more experienced companions. Even art is taught by teachers. Some thoughts for the day.